attention class, I'd like you all to welcome a new student joining us for today's field trip to the Metroplex. This is Sari Sundak. Sari's classmates night beat Hope's head and Siren stare at her curiously. They've never seen a techno organic before. Sari, likewise, has never been to Cybertron before. But after discovering she was part Cybertronian, she decided to join her Autobot friends Optimus Prime, Bumblebee, Bulkhead, and Ratchet, and the late lamented Prowl, as they returned to their home planet so she could learn more about her true origins. R.C. wasn't the most exciting teacher, but she was still a heck of a lot more engaging than her old tutor bot. Judging from the residue on the soles of your shoes, I can deduce you are not native to Iacon. Nightgate examined Sari carefully. Perhaps an exchange student from one of the tri-peninsular Taurus states. Protohex, or Praxis. Tri-Earth, Sherlock? So, uh, what are all those fiber optics on top of your head, booty? It's called hair. Ah! It's so gross! <laughs> Use your inside voice, Siren. Boosh your outside, I think. The Metroplex is the center of our entire Cybertronian government, as well as our Science Gut Guild and Intelligence Division. RC proceeds to lead the class through the massive structure. It also houses an infirmary where I myself spent many stellar cycles after my memory had been wiped out by the... Oh, <laughs> but you probably don't want to hear my old war stories. But the students aren't paying attention anyway. <laughs> They're more focused on the contents of the strange bag Sari has brought with her. Oh, what's in the sack, eh? Judging from the color and consistency, it's clearly some form of engine valve degreaser. Actually, it's takeout from BurgerBot. My dad sent it from Earth through the space bridge. The best part? Sari adds, holding a paper cup filled with red soda. Is this fake old red bot pop? You can only get this stuff in Detroit. Oh, you gonna ingest that? In your vocal processor? Inside voice, Siren. Sorry! I'm sorry. Uh, this is the Cybertronian Intelligence Division. Announces RC as she leads the class down the secure corridor. Normally, civilians don't have access to this area, but as a former intel agent myself, I was able to pull a few circuits. Sorry is too busy slurping down the last of her fake old red bop pop to notice. She lets out a loud burp, which startles her classmates. Oh, scrap! Oh, guys! Siren forgetting once again to use his inside voice. Wasn't me. Then how come I can smell the disgusting red liquid coming from your vocal processor? Yeah, what do you think we are, a bunch of goofies? As R.C. and her classmates move to the next stop on the tour, an embarrassed Sari decides to dispose of the evidence while no one's looking. She sneaks behind a desk and backs up to a disposal hatch to, se to secretly toss the soda cup in, but loses her balance and tumbles down the chute. Whoa! Unfortunately, neither R.C. nor her classmates see this as they walk out of the corridor. Sari and her soda cup tumble into a shadowy room landing on a top of a pile of scrap metal and other debris. As she touches the strange-looking cube of compressed metal, an all-spark-like glow emits from within. Suddenly, a voice cries out from the cube. The cube is talking, and very quickly. Hello? Is anyone there? I can't see a thing. What happened to me? The last thing I remember was a running away from Long Island Prom who was trying to kill me, although I have my sister's who's living through the Decepticon double agent in Shockwave who was really pretending to be Long Island Prom, so many Long Island Prom ever really existed. <laughs> oh. Sorry is shocked at the voice. Once she can actually get a word in edgewise, she asks, 
My name is Blur, and I'm the fastest Autobot there is or was before I got compressed into this cube of scrap metal. I'm an Autobot intelligent agent sent to Earth by the elite guard to keep an eye on Optimus Prime and end up helping his crew throughout the attack by Megatron to activate space bridge and stage, uh, stage sneak attack on Cybertron. I was inadvertently teleported to a remote sector of the pair of Star Scream clones, but they escaped them and returned to Cybertron to warn Longtime Prime of a deception double agent named Shockwave in the midst of them. I'm about to say, you know, now that I say it, I'm glad I realized that uh, Longtime Prime was the Decepticon double agent. Can we do a take two? <laughs> <laughs> Have I ever heard that before? <laughs> Sorry, of course, already knows this story. Now that she, not that she could interrupt Blur's rapid-fire monologue to tell him. Sorry was a member of Optimus Prime's crew on Earth. Although she never got the chance to meet Blur, she's heard Bumblebee complain many times about how annoying he was. <laughs> and now, she knows Bumblebee did not exaggerate. Sari also realizes that she must have some residual all-spark energy still left in her from when she used her key to upgrade herself. It's a long story. But since Sari can't talk as fast as Blur, she doesn't have enough time to tell him. <laughs> Suffice to say, Sari is responsible for instilling some life-giving all-spark energy into Blur and raising the hopes of fans who were left traumatized by his apparent demise. <laughs> not to mention a certain voice actor who begged us not to kill him off. <laughs> Searching for an exit, Sari discovers an access panel and tries to use her tech-savvy powers to activate it and open up the door. When Sari uses her key to upgrade herself, see long story above. She obtained the ability to communicate with machines. She used that ability to help restore RC's lost long, long lost memories. But that's another long story. The complete DVD set is still available if you're interested. <laughs> Otherwise, just trust me on this. Anyway, what Sari doesn't realize, as she activates the panel, she already inadvertently activated something else. She used to do that a lot, especially in seasons one and two. <laughs> but this particular something is a fan favorite, gremlin-like being of pure energy named Cream Zeke. Why a being of pure energy needs a name at all is beyond me, but there you have it. As Nightbeat, Siren, and the Hosehead, Remember them? Visit the council chamber. R.C. takes a head count and realizes Sari is missing. Maybe she went out to the washroom, eh? Good! I hope she's washing out that disgusting burger! I mean, how does an organic transform into that thing? Is it like... <laughs> I understand it transforms into something even worse inside of her. R.C. just upped the gross quotient of this story. Nightbeat, however, perks up, excited at this turn of events. Sari's disappearance is a mystery to be solved. We just need to search for clues, interrogate witnesses, beat confessions out of snitches. We will do no such thing, young bot. Killjoy. Suddenly, suddenly an alarm blares. A voice projects over the PA system. Intruder in recycling center. Intruder in recycling center. Now that sounds like a clue. The lights suddenly come on to reveal that Sari and the Blur Cube are sitting on a conveyor belt that leads into a massive array of deadly looking machinery. <coughs> Razor sharp shredders, pile driving mashers, and an enormous smelting furnace. Naturally, Blur has quite a bit to say on the subject. Clearly, we have landed on a central cybertronic recycling plant, a facility that was utilized extensively during the great war between the Autobots and the Decepticons, but with the constant supply of scrap metal was an essential component of the ongoing defense efforts. Fortunately, the center has been non-operational since our hardcore victory against the ruthless fanatical Decepticons obviating any need to slash, hack, crush, pulverize, course, melt, or otherwise mutilate discarded cybernetic components such as ourselves. <laughs> but Sari notices a crackling, impish being of pure energy zap itself into the machinery, which suddenly whirs to life. Sorry grabs the blur cube and scrambles to outrun the now-moving conveyor belt and avoid being shredded by the whirring blades or crushed by the pounding, slamming mashers. Been there, done that. <laughs> Replies the blur cube at Micro Machine's commercial speed. Been there, done that. <laughs> and I can tell you from personal experience that I do not recommend it in the least or I do not wish to add to my ongoing list and list of antiquities by filter natural molten metal by the supernova level heat emanating from that upcoming smelting furnace directly in open! Sorry, meanwhile, touches the equipment and uses her tech-savvy power to determine there's something inside the machinery. An intelligence. An evil. 
intelligence. Unfortunately, Creamsy takes the opportunity to send a zap of electricity through the works that causes straps to lash out and tie down Sari to the conveyor belt in a classic silent movie predicament. <laughs> and she and Fleur move directly towards the flaming furnace. <laughs> Oh no! What will happen? Do we dare continue the story? Yeah! Dot, dot, dot. <laughs> Whew! Sorry and Blur are okay. It seems R.C. and her classmates rushed in at the last possible second and rescued them. Hosehead used his namesake hoses to douse the furnace with a powerful flame retardant foam, while R.C. used her laser blades to slice Sari free. Siren uses his sonic power to blast the pile, blast the pile drivers to smithereens, and Night jammed up the gears of the conveyor belt with several adhesive spewing pellets from her utility belt. It was a nail-biting, suspens suspenseful action sequence that would have looked awesome in animation. <laughs> but can hardly be done justice with what just a single storybook illustration. Don't you wish season four had been produced now? <laughs> <coughs> what happened here? Well, I was unwittingly disposed of here and left for dead by Cliff Jumper, the behest of a long-time prom who was in reality because of the Decepticon that played Shockwave, after which nothing much happened for a very long time, like the remainder of season three, to be precise, until this techno organ unit quite literally stepped upon me and reignited my spark through a conveniently plot, de convenient plot device she carries within her, also bringing to life a mischievous maniacal uh, being a pure energy who sabotages recycling facility and attempted to lead us into an ultimate and timely demise. Thank you, Blur, for summarizing the entire story up to this point. <laughs> Maniacal being of pure energy? R.C. miraculously picking up that the crucial plot point amid Blur's endless babbling and seems slightly concerned. You must be talking about Kremzik. Adds R.C. in an uncanny leap of logic that provides the necessary exposition. <laughs> I remember it from my intel days. It's an old Decepticon Trojan horse program designed to sabotage cybernetic systems capable of jumping from unit to unit if it's not contained. Sorry touches the machine, but no longer senses the evil presence. Suddenly, Nightbeat's eyes glow red and turn creamsick shaped. <laughs> She states for the readers who otherwise wouldn't be able to figure out what's happening. <laughs> With that, she attacks Sari, transforms into vehicle mode, and zooms for exit. I must get to Fortress Maximus. <laughs> In a shocking twist. The Creamsy possessed Nightbeat conveniently reveals the villain's plot so the heroes can save the day. RC quickly activates the control panel and seals off the room. Heavy reinforced security doors slam into place, blocking Creamsy slash Nightbeat's escape. Fortress Maximum is the Cybertronian defense hub. If Creamsy gets in into there, he could destroy all of Cybertron. Explains RC, setting the stakes for the remainder of the story. The Crimson possessed Nightbeat attacks RC, who whips out her twin laser swords to deflect the attacks with an impressive display of sword spot ship. <laughs> no one is more impressed than Sari, yet perpetual victim RC's sudden inexplicable badassery. <laughs> He was trying to make pointers for my lectures, but he got a little carried away. Just when it looks like RC will get the upper servo on Nightbeat, Creamsy leaps out of Nightbeat and into Siren. 
Siren's eyes glow red and turn crimson shaped as the devilish being of pure energy forces him to use his sonic power to blast a hole in the wall. <laughs> Nothing will stop Crimson from reaching Fortress Maximus! <laughs> Blares the crimson controlled siren in his non-inside voice, <laughs> once again reminding the reader of his plan. Hey, how about a deuce of my foe, man? Replies Jose as he douses, a uh, deuces, uh, uh, deuces, douses siren with a flame retardant from his hose, forcing crimson to jump out of siren and into Jose's head, who runs out through the hole siren blasted. Sari pulls out her scooter, which conveniently appears from out of nowhere like a Beast Wars weapon. <laughs> she transforms the scooter into a jetpack and flies after the crimson controlled hose head into a tunnel. She catches up and grabs hose head, but as she does so, crimson leaps out of Holmes' hose head and into Sari's backpack. Sari and hose head thud to the floor as Sari's backpack backpack soars off now controlled by Crimson. Bummery, we'll never catch Crimson in time, eh? Sorry insists that they must. They will. Aw, oh, take off, sorry. Responds Jose, pronouncing her name like a true Canadian. <laughs> we need, like, the fastest Autobot there is to catch up now, eh? Uh, well, the fastest Autobot there is... Repeats Sari, an idea forming in her techno-organic brain. Sari plugs the blur cube into her backpack, suddenly infused with his spark or something like that. She inexplicably gains his powers and zips out after Crimson at super speed. But before she could take off, RC grabs onto Sari and speeds off with her. Uh, how is this even possible? I mean, even given Sari's Season 3 upgrade may have given her increased strength, although it was never explicitly stated, the sheer size comparison between RC and Sari, the added burden of carrying me in a cube form on her back would make it extremely cumbersome to run, or any two blade skate, as the case may be, at such a loss of any continuous duration, thus stretching credibility even beyond normal levels for this series. <laughs> on the streets of Iacon, Cybertron's defense bots Cheetor and Sideswipe react to rapid whoosh of motion sweeping past them at sonic boom-producing speed thus providing a cameo from BotCon 2011 comic. <laughs> Since Cyborg so retired to the Energon form at the end of that story, we'll just say that this story takes place but uh, during the Stunticon job then, but that's it, right? No. Jumping gyros! Now that's what I call fast! If I didn't uh, know better, Cheetah, I'd say that was a blue version of yourself. <laughs> Sidesweep clearly making an obscure repaint reference. Meanwhile, Blur acts as, as GPS rapid talking directions to Fortress Maximus to the non-Cybertron familiar Sari. All right, you want to take Avalon Boulevard, pass back in the oil house, duck into the alley behind a wrong way, and cut the Cyber Ninja Dojo to the Dojo spaceport. RC interrupts Blur, if such a thing is possible. No, 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 no. You want to avoid all that construction at Dole Raven. Take a detour through the underground tunnels, then you'll bypass Trypticon Prison. Come up at the Space Bridge Nexus and cut through the Autobot Boot Camp. Uh, Autobot Boot Camp has been shut down since the last wave of Protoform recruits graduated, or you would, would know that if you hadn't spent the final wave of the Great War in the memory wipe coma, thanks to your Metabot boyfriend. First of all, he's not my boyfriend. Counters RC, although it's clear we were hinting in Season 3 that Ratchet has feelings for her. <laughs> Second of all, we can't take another round. Those are the only Cybertronian backgrounds that have been designed. <laughs> Meanwhile, inside Trypticon Prison, the captive Decepticons, you didn't think that we'd get through the story without seeing them, did you? Are held in stasis lock. But that doesn't stop Shockwave from realizing that his failsafe Crimson program has been activated and is, on a, is on set on a course to destroy all of Cybertron. Megatron asks Shockwave why he would create such a foolish program. Hey, yes, my lord. Can't really, uh, can't really hear them mainly because Corey Burton is far, far, far away. But it sounds like they're just saying it. It, it has to do with the fact that it, this happened and they, they weren't even supposed to be here today. So, shoe polish involved. 
Continuing on, inside Fortress Maximus Control Center, Jet Fire, Jet Storm, Overseas Cybertronian Defense Grid with Sentinel Prime. That's Sentinel Magnets! <laughs> Sentinel, correcting the narrator, and breaking the fourth wall seems to have happened quite often within these stories. Oh, oh, also, he's technically only an acting Magnus, while Ultra Magnus recovers from the beatdown Shockwave gave him with his own hammer. Shockwave ruins everything, doesn't he? Yes. Nevertheless, Sentinel is too focused on his own self-importance to notice as Sari's jetpack flies into the room, then clunks on the floor as Crazy flies out and into the control system. Why is enormous photon pulse cannon to be activating? Asked Jetfire. And why is enormous photon pulse cannon to be aiming at City of Iacon? Asks Jetstorm. <laughs> How did you get past security? <laughs> Asks Sentinel as Sari, RC, and Blur the Blur Cube suddenly whiz into the room. Blur Cube begins to rapidly recap the entire story once again, but Sari mercifully cuts him off. She puts her hand on the control console and uses her cyber savvy ability to calculate a means of overriding Cream Zeke's control and shut down the cannon. Sari, don't! Cream Zeke can jump into any cybernetic system. Sure enough, Cream Zeke jumps out of the control console and into sorry. <laughs> but the imp of pure energy is unable to take control of Sari's techno-organic system. Her ears and nose shoot out sparks as Cream Zeke attempts to escape. We need to find something to contain Cream Zeke. Like this, like this cup of fake old red, red pop pop? Sorry pulls out the soda cup that was so convenient, uh, <clears throat> scratch that, Kev cleverly introduced in the beginning of this story. With a loud burp. Nope, don't. <laughs> Sorry spits Cream Zink out of her mouth and into the cup, securing the lid and sealing it up. We need it Gary Chalk. <laughs> In the Cyber Ninja Dojo, Optimus Prime, in his obligatory cameo, and Jazz use the AllSpark to restore the Blurred Cube to his former bot mode, causing half of the fan base to breathe a sigh of relief. And the other half to complain about the lack of real consequences in this universe. Now, class. What do we have to say to Sari for using her wits and bravery to save the day? Oh, there's a lot for me! Spinning beans and pure energy into a used soda bottle is really gross! <laughs> Siren, in that voice, it's not so inside that it could wake up the well of all sparks. You look up! The hockey and back bacon! Posehead, thoroughly exhausting his Canadian stereotype dialogue. We've learned to respect our differences and not judge a data track by its techno-organic cover. Thank you, Nightbeat, for wrapping up this story's theme with a pro-social bow that any network executive could appreciate. Stay for the Cartoon Network! Meanwhile, an ecstatic blur does super speed laps around the dojo, happily declaring, I'm finally going to become a regular featured player just in time for season four! Season 4! Of course it's a Season 4! Transformers is back on Cartoon Network, Cartoon Network, isn't it? Robots in disguise? Well, wait, haven't they said already? Yeah, twice. Never mind. Get my agent on the phone. I want a recurring. I want stunt cast and guest shot. I mean, if I mentioned in passing, maybe you should get voice directing. Voice directing? That sounds like a good idea. I think so. <laughs> Take another plate. <laughs> and all the roles have been recast as Frank Wilder. Thank you. <laughs> enjoyed that. Um, that will conclude this panel, so everybody give a big round of applause again.